Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. Efren, welcome to the podcast. How you doing, brother? I'm good, Pete, and thanks for inviting me on. I know we've uh, we kind of already had a little bit. We've already had a little chat this morning, but we had a little catch up the other day as well. And for people that are unfamiliar, you've got a lovely wide ranging background. But ultimately, um, the connection that we came together today, uh, you're one of the co founders of a strongman charity, and you actually came to my attention through a variety of things. Actually, so one is the unfortunate number of servicemen and women who are taking their lives, and then we actually had one of the firefighters on my station uh, two months ago, unfortunately take his life and then through some of the work i've been doing obviously as part of sas who dares wins and one of my uh, fellow recruits on there spoke ad nauseum with uh, some great uh, compliments about yourself and about what you've created so we kind of came together and there's lots of things i want to get into today but before we came on we were just talking about yappy little dogs (laughs) and uh, i wanted to throw that into the adult context because it's actually something that i can sort of associate with myself i'm six foot i tell people i'm six five but sometimes i'm six six but i always say six five i'm a big guy i used to be a lot bigger um as i took a whole bunch of stuff that i shouldn't have been taking and i was trying to perpetuate this idea of what i thought was a manly man when i was younger i was trying to be big and muscular and all of these horrible connotations but what came with it was that aspect of how you perceived as well and that kind of that kind of came to my mind when we were talking about dogs then so i suppose i kind of want to start by asking you about that perception of men and um, why men struggle with certain things and why we think those society has such a fixed stereotype of what we maybe should be gosh i mean that's that one of those questions that i think a lot of a lot of the stereotypes that you know, i don't know perhaps we build are in our own minds so you're creating that image for yourself so to be a man i need to be six foot five mm. 15 stone because uh there's a perception of that. I mean, if you look at the, 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 the guys in the films, if you take a Jack Reacher type character, yeah. Lee Child's book, they're always Lawrence Delalio yeah. type builds. Uh, and that I guess is one of those things that you easily associate with. Hmm. Um, is it reality? No, of course it's not reality. I mean, I'm five foot nine ish, hmm. something along those lines, maybe five, 10 on a good day. <laughs> Um, I'm about 80 kilos and it's never bothered me at all. Um, I, it, I guess, I mean, when you go to gyms and bits and bobs like that, the places are full of young guys sat there taking pictures of themselves, mm. doing not a lot at all, um, <laughs> trying to just lift big heavy weights. And I, I used to say to them years back, I mean, what, what's, you know, what do you want to do? I want to be big, but what does that even mean? What, and what is the mean? point of being big? Yeah. What does being big mean? What does that get you? It's not really a goal to be able to do something. It's just making yourself big. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress. And we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. This is what I'm saying. How much of this is born out of like our animalist instincts? Because there's a couple of directions to go in there. I mean, there are lots and lots of statistics out there that say about political figures and how most you know, speak with a deep voice, their males over six foot, all of these stereotypes. And some of that lies in the aspect of the alpha male, you know, the biggest thing in the pack. But we live in an age now where actually, well, we've always been significantly weaker and more febile than all of our other mammals on the world. So it's not, it's not inherently a useful trait anymore for us to continue to perpetuate. And not only that, speaking about specifically about what strong men do, it also sometimes masks the ability for people to express themselves emotionally and to find um, healthy outlets for challenges they may be having because they're holding on so tight to this uh, to this ideal I suppose yeah I think it I mean the reality of it is very different you know what makes a man 
but there is an element of physicality to it but most of it is emotionally and, uh, and mentally and how you treat other people and how you treat those around you your family around you uh, and how you react in in difficult moments I guess because if you can compose yourself uh, and be confident in yourself and your abilities and you know there's this overused thing about to lead people but what does it even mean most people don't need leading they just need the confidence to be able to look after themselves in a certain way whether that's through training or whether that's through experience or whether through is it's all I guess depends on the situation that they're in you know if you're in an airplane and all of a sudden it's it's going to crash you could be the best leader in the world but if you can't fly a plane you're dumb <laughs> So yeah. it makes no difference. <laughs> so there's that element of it as well. But what you might be able to do is stay calm at the back, get people to sit down, say that obviously, and that's more of a reality of life, isn't it? When things mm. go wrong, if you could just compose people, maybe galvanize people, make them look after themselves and, and reassure them that, you know, everything is being done that can be done and hopefully everything will be okay. I think it's a lot better than running around, throwing things, picking up massive weights and, screaming at people because that never gets you anywhere really in the realities of life and if you look at something like a military background or military setting or even a something like the police service or whatever it is there's obviously hierarchy there based on hopefully experience but mm. generally speaking just how people are rank wise in the military it doesn't mean they're even better at their job in that scenario and often no. you'll get the N ncos who will have a lot more experience and tend to be those that take over because the officers maybe don't even have that experience so i think mm naturally spec you know leaders and uh, and confident people people just tend to gravitate towards them and then hopefully the good stuff rubs up on them and it makes them better at what they're doing and that's you know that's that's where we are with it in my opinion but you know i'm not a six foot five inch bloke weighing 150 kilos so i've had to well that's one of the big things like i've been working on for the last few years and in all honesty it's kind of led to the creation of the podcast because i would love for people to um you know when i meet them for my physicality size or whatever it might be to be one of the least important things in the room i think it would be so sad with the greatest respect to anyone else but like so sad if that is you what you believe to be your best qualities because all of your physical attributes will fail and fade at some point in time so if you can't demonstrate yourself as your ability to articulate yourself and things like that then you're really setting yourself up to fail i mean some of the stuff we're speaking about there is there's an argument for nature and nurture so seeing you speak and seeing what you do with the charity i wanted to kind of cycle back for a second to just find a little bit more about where you kind of grew up and what your family dynamic was so i'm born and bred in sussex i still live in sussex i was born in brighton i'm 50 so i was born in 1972 i was unremarked just a usual sort of kid at school went to school reasonably academic reasonably sporting enjoyed my sport um did okay at school stayed on to college to do my A-levels, no particular path or um, goal in that respect. I didn't really know what, like most lads of 15, 16, didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a rally driver. My careers officer said I should go and work in a bank. And it's like, well, how could you go from being a rally driver to working in a bank? And she said to me, have you even got a driving license? To which I said, no, that's a good point. Obviously, I haven't. So, But anyway, so I, I went to college. That's where I went met Sharon and Sharon is my was my girlfriend shortly thereafter and is now my wife so we've known each other a very long time wow and she fell pregnant with James um, I was 18 and she was 17 so we were very very young parents um, and then things just changed because I realized I had to stop being a bit of a dreamer you know I played lead guitar in a band and all that sort of stuff there was no mm -hmm. real responsibility it didn't you know none of that ever came into the equation so Quickly got myself a job, uh, which which was in construction. Um, I only literally applied to an advert. I didn't know what the job was, didn't know anything about it. But because they paid me seven grand a year, believe it or not, was my starting wow. wage. And I had to drive from Shoreham to Crawley, which is about a 45-minute journey, and a knackered old car. So the vast majority of my money went in petrol and trying to keep the car on the road. So seven grand a year. Uh, we lived in a caravan. It was a, a static caravan on a beach, one of these sort of residential beach Bloody places hell. where old people go on holiday yeah uh, james was born on the 22nd of december 1990 he was born with jaundice so because he was born just before christmas they let him bring us home they let us bring him home on christmas eve but because he was really ill 
he was readmitted on Boxing Day uh, into intensive care. So he had to go on a, a monitor and sit there with all the tubes and bits and bobs in, which was a scary experience mm. at 18 and 17. Because when you're that age, especially back then, when you're that age and you look that age, you know, I had longish hair, spots, was about mm. seven stone ringing where people don't take you seriously as a parent. Um, no. Like we were saying a minute ago, there's that stereotype of you. And I turned up in a knackered old full cortina, you live in a caravan. I mean, it does, none of this sounds good. So they treat you in the same in the same way, which they have I've a always, concerned look on their face of like they do, oh, yeah, yeah. And I've always tried to avoid that as, as I've got older because I know what it's like to be on that side of things. And my wife now is a specialist nurse who looks after kids with very complex needs. Mm. Um, talking, do you think you were my, ready to be parents then? Sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. I mean, it, I hadn't crossed my mind, but I'd had. Uh, I'd had not a particularly happy childhood, so I knew what it was like to be a bad parent. So my okay. theory was you just do the opposite of that. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't uh, think and, anyone's and, ever going to write a good book on it, with all due respect. No, I think it's like art, isn't it? It's a very personal it, thing. It's personal, and it depends on your circumstances. And obviously, we had no money. Uh, but what we did decide is when James was born um, in 1990, we wanted to have another child reasonably soon after. So we would, wow. if you like, complete our family. So we had my daughter, Yasmin, was born in September 1992. Uh, and we then decided that that was, at that time, the end of our family. And then we could concentrate on doing other bits and bobs. So I just kept working. Sharon brought the kids up. Um, she eventually started working. So she's now, as I say, a specialist nurse. She's a very high caliber specialist nurse, looks after kids uh, with life-limiting conditions and often terminally ill children. Uh, and one of the attributes she brings to that job is she has great empathy because a lot of the a lot of the mums are quite young uh, mm. and they are perhaps on their own living in really awful conditions. And she can say with 100 percent experience, Look, I have been where you are uh, and I know what your concerns are. Whereas often when we had nurses and health visitors visit us, they look very much down at you. It's like, God, you're just a statistic. Doing it all we were, wrong. Yeah. This yeah. And we were determined not to government be. bill at some point in time. We're all going to carry you forever. Absolutely. And that was the determination that we would never, ever be that. So as soon as we could, we that got go off both that ways, though, doesn't it? Sorry, it's like, more often than not, it goes the other saying way, is, they're yeah. like, look at a man as he is, and that's all he'll ever be. But if you look at a man as what he could be, then it's sort of limitless, isn't it? But so many times, society in general, I suppose, but we can be guilty of looking at someone as they are now and judging them on it. But, you know, it, it's almost like, does that, is it's chicken and egg scenario? Does that then lead to some of these poor sort of societal dynamics that we have. I don't know. It's really easy to go down the wrong path. I mean, we were housed in some awful areas. You know, I remember walking into a block of flats where there's a homeless man at the bottom of the stairs who soiled himself and you've got your kids, you've got to walk, it's disgusting. Mm. So, but we were, always had a huge amount of fire in both of our bellies to, to really prove people wrong, to prove what the attributes that we have. And I, I truly believe that, Sharon and I were blessed to be put together at such a young age because we share, although we're very different in terms of our personal tastes, you know, she's got a terrible taste in music. She's got terrible <laughs> taste in TV, terrible taste in all of these things. Whereas mine she's got is a great taste in men though, hasn't she? She's got fantastic taste in men. Yeah. <laughs> whereas mine's the opposite. So, but we're very different on the outside in what we like, but we've, we, we really, our DNA is very much the same. And we were hundred percent dedicated to make sure that our children had everything that we could provide for them which we hadn't had of, as children, mm. but without spoiling them. So when they grew up, they would have the same DNA with them to want to achieve as much as they could, to work as hard as they can, and to respect everybody around them, whether that be someone who was in our situation or somebody who's you know way, way further up the ladder, if that's the right word. So we mm. brought them into the world, and we've always made sure that that's the case. And that's proven to be the case. There's no greater feeling of have accomplished great being but great parents is when you see your children honestly care and do stuff for other people who are less lucky than themselves without yeah. wanting to put it on Instagram or make a big deal of it. They can just do it. And that's exactly what we brought the kids up as. And that's exactly what they've done. So we then hope that as they go into the world, you know, it spreads and you can spread the good message of, of what, what the world's about rather than all the, the bad stuff that, as you say, is easy to, to get into because it's a lot easier to do that. Hmm. So how long were you in the construction game for? Because you you seem to, that, that was a almost a path that laid itself out in front of you and you seem to progress well with it, if memory recalls. Yeah, so I worked my way through. I eventually became the sales director of a company that spent us specialist partitioning. 
uh, the company turns over about 12 million when I left. So I was one of the sort of wow. th- the larger cogs in that machine and I worked my way all the way through uh, and I'd done, I'd done well. There was that I'd say without sounding cocky and I don't, there was no one better at my job in the whole industry because I think my background helped me in that respect. And I was very humble and realized that, that at no point there's nothing worse than when people do well. And then they, you know, it's like the old, it's hard to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go for a run when you're wearing silk pajamas type yes. thing. I think it was Marvin Hagler that said it. It's the same yeah. thing. And you lose all of that stuff. You know, sometimes you lose track of it a little bit and you need reminding about it. But I've always had that luckily in me that's kept my feet on the ground. And Sharon helps me with that. And the kids help me with that. So work my way through that. And that was really good. Um, and I'm still doing a little bit of working construction as a consultant now because I quite enjoy the sector. I've got lots of good friends and colleagues in it. So I still dabble in that now because running a charity doesn't pay the bills. No. Uh, whereas doing the consultancy stuff uh, pays the bills and allows you to do all the other bits of bobs you need to do. So with your children, so Yasmin and James, they're obviously something went fairly well because James chose to join the military. What did Yasmin uh, go on to do if you're okay to share? So Yasmin is a very, very interesting. So she, when James died um, in 2013, she was in retail. So she was working um, Horsh, uh, Guildford at the time. So she was in retail sales. She'd done pretty well, but it wasn't what she wanted to do. She was just transitioning into social care uh, when James died, which obviously it was a huge knock to all of us. So she took a career break from that uh, and just really thrashed around a little bit till she found out what she wanted to do and she actually ended up joining the military so she wow. became yeah <laughs> uh, a combat medic technician so her like her mother Hell. she's got a real flair for everything medical so she went into the military she was a, a, a part of the royal army medical corps she then left the army she joined brighton and hove albion um in their first, first team in their medical she was the one of only two women the first team medical department which she did really well for about three four five years as they went through to the premier league she then uh, started her master's degree in osteopathy at the same time yeah so she just graduated a couple of weeks ago from the london school of osteopathy as an osteopath so she's now doing that as a career self-employed so yeah her, her career path has yeah <laughs> she's got, obviously full, got full, that full. similar that similar um sort of determination and resiliency that, that you guys have embedded within her so let's let's talk in and around that because the aspect of james joining the military at all so did you have any military background in your family and how did you feel when james first made the decision that he wanted to join well we've always had an interest i mean my grandparents my grandfather in particular served in the second world war he was in the tank regiment and my grandmother's brother was killed he was in a lancaster rear gunner as a, a lancaster in the raf and was shot down and killed so we have that background but it's a few generations beforehand my cousin was in the raf he was a tornado navigator but not specifically but what we i've always had an interest in it which has really been drummed into me by my grandfather mm-hmm. which i shared with james and he had an interest in it he wanted to join actually the fire service believe it or not but they weren't recruiting at this stage which would have been 2011 ish uh because of the many uh, it's always been historically so that, very difficult to get in anyway it's a bit of a lottery with certain types yeah. of emergency services certain the fire service it's a bit of a weird one yeah so that was i mean he went he went to college and did um uh sports science and then he sort of meandered a little bit into the pt side of things the money's terrible God, he sounds like me <laughs> yeah the money's terrible and it, it wasn't it didn't really float his boat so then there was the no. fire service because that didn't happen so he then he went to the army careers office he wanted to be in the parachute uh, regiment but they talked him into going to military intelligence because he was very analytical quite intelligent as well as physically very capable and that's the route he took which was in 2011 joined the military how did the two of you feel when he first joined because there was there were ongoing conflicts at this time people have mixed feelings obviously like you say you have a proud family heritage in, in it but it can still be a scary concept when people enter into any frontline sector for certain people I wanted to jump in and just speak to you about a real ugly truth that despite the fact we are trying so hard, we get way too many messages and emails about mental well-being and mental health. And I recently came across something I think is going to be a real game changer. It's called Genesis. Now, this is really different because it's actually human-led mental and social well-being. It's not just an app somewhere that no one's ever going to use. They provide human-led, regular bite-sized approaches. I'm talking 15 minutes at a time, using language in a structured learning approach to create safe spaces for teams to have these conversations. 
And they've got a whole bunch of free workshops coming up online. First one is the 23rd of February, and it's built around sleep and performance with Dr. Martin Jones as a human performance and sleep specialist. You can find all this in the link to the podcast. Another thing I'd specifically say looking at is their 90-day program, which has been designed exclusively for well-being leaders in the police and fire and rescue sectors. It actually gives you some tangible tools to have these structured conversations so we can genuinely start to reduce burnout, absenteeism, and general poor mental health. It's not just a tick box, guys. So scroll down, have a look in the notes to this podcast. The first one is on the 23rd of February. I'm going to be there. And the reason I'm actually going to attend something like this versus other stuff is because it's human-led. It's actually going to be real people talking in a way that I can relate to and it's easy to implement with my team. So hopefully I'll see you there. We were on holiday when we found out uh, and Yasmin and James were at home and they'd had an argument and she blurted out that he'd, he'd signed up to join the army. So yeah. it was a shock. Um was it actually a shock? No, he he definitely has the the cal- he definitely had the attributes to make a success in the military. So I wasn't surprised, and in a way, we were pleased because we felt that it would bring the best out of him, mm. and he would bring the best out of it. So it'd be a perfect marriage um, in that respect. So you know, with hindsight and retrospectively, of course, we wish that hadn't happened, but you know, you can't change that now. So, and he flourished in the military. He did really, really well. He did some specific training and courses that most people would fail at uh, he was an exceptional soldier um and it's it is it's i guess that's one of the saddest things for us when we look at it it's not just in his personal life where he would have gone and what he would have been would he have been a father where would he be now because he would be 30 coming up to 32 years old hmm. professionally i think he would have done really well as well and we, we keep in contact with some of his close friends that went through basic training with him and also who he was um, who he was with in the various attachments that he went out with into the into the army, and they all speak very highly of him, and they think he would have done really, really well. So it's sad, but try not to think about it too much because there's nothing we can do about that. And you know, who knows what the future would have, what would have happened in those, that nine, ten years that's happened in between. So take us to that day because I remember when I was reading more about your story, it was kind of this was that pivotal fork in the road around 2013 when life for yourself, for Yasmin, for your partner kind of took a tangent and perhaps gave you a different perspective on life. Talk to us about what happened on that moment. I mean, it's hard to put it into words. Uh, it was just a normal day. James was deployed for the second time. So we had got used to the feeling of him not being here not just through deployment, but pre-deployment. He basically went He went to pre-deployment training, Afghanistan, pre-deployment deployment, uh, training, Afghanistan. So in that period, we barely saw him and he was away for long periods of time. And when we did see him, he'd come back, he'd be knackered. So <laughs> he just used to see his girlfriend go out and sleep. So we kind of got used to him not being around. We'd, our lives had molded around that circumstance. So did you, you know, did just, you change your sort of interactions with news at all? Sorry, just like, did you, because no, some parents no. speak about limiting their exposure to it because it can send their mind in a thousand directions that we didn't, those things no, weren't didn't. in your head? No, I mean, on his first deployment, we barely heard from him. So we thought that would be the case. <clears> but this time we got emails and Facebook messenger and these bits and bobs. I mean, I had a message for him from him the day before he died. So you know, it it almost seemed normal to get a message, maybe the odd picture or where he'd been, and then a, just a short message about what he was. And, you know, very some very simple things like, can you sort out this for me? This yeah. is about to run out. <laughs> Literal, normal. So it's just normal. Yeah. So I always, I'm the opposite. I try and find out as much as I can rather than limit it because there's nothing I can do to change whatever happens. But I didn't think for one minute it would happen or it would happen because well, anything bad would happen because as I say, physically he was hugely capable. Mm. He'd always done really well in everything that he'd done. I mean, he represented the County at football, England schools and colleges. He was an exceptional physical guy and very academic as well. So, but what you learn through life is that doesn't matter if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. However, like we were saying earlier about this leadership thing and people say, you know, nothing was ever going to get me or kill me, but it doesn't work like that. If you're in the outside lane of a motorway and a lorry just pulls out and wipes you out, there's nothing. You could be Lewis Hamilton and you're not getting out of it. Look at Ayrton Senna. He died. Probably the greatest driver of one of the greatest drivers of all time. He'd crashed and died. So it happens. So we didn't limit it like that, but it was just a normal day that 
like much like any other day much like today it was october so it was kind of gray cold not particularly nice but not particularly nasty and then we literally got that news which um it just wiped us not instantly that sort of adrenaline kicks in and the disbelief of it kicks in and the what do we do now kicks in and the how do we tell people what do we do what how does the next? news come in sorry so you get a a I think they're called a casualty visiting officer. So they knock on your door and tell you the news. And then they tell you that you'll be getting a liaison officer um, that will then look after you the following day. So I wasn't even in. I was, I'd was i gone to drop some stuff off to the tip and then I'd nipped into the gym to do a quick session in there. And my daughter was in and she rang me to say that there was someone there from the army, which I really wish Bloody it hell. hadn't have been her that had yeah. to have that. Uh, I wish it had been me, but there's, again, nothing I can do to change that. So... Literally is the knock on the door that you get, you know, no different to I'm sure happens with some of the things you've been involved in in yeah, fires yeah, or road yeah. traffic accidents. It's just, unfortunately, some poor buggers got to deliver that news uh, and they do. And then everything just, um, you know, unravels and you kind of hang on for a little bit for a period of time. Uh, we had it, it, repatriations to think about, which are. What were the details around James's death? Uh, so he was, he was, killed by small arms fire. He would have been on, a, on an operation. It's part of a handover operation between the outgoing Brigade Reconnaissance Force and he was part of the incoming. So he went out a month earlier than his colleagues just to take over some of the technical side of things. So he was a light electronic warfare technician, wow. um, which is one of the guys that listens on the radio to enemy. They work out where they are and then with intelligence work out what they do next. So uh, as part of the operation, as it finished, they were just withdrawing from their area, became dangerously exposed, got into a firefight, uh, and James was shot and killed instantly. So it was as simple as that. And it was, I mean, you don't get, the problem is you don't get this information. You get very limited information because obviously it's from the so world. That's got to be so difficult, not having, having holes in the story. And it's kind of like, I, I get it because potentially in some of these cases, it may be a criminal case of the conditions of how they how they were passed. And but as the recipient of that information, I think that's where perhaps the first responder community is a little bit easier because of the majority of the time you can give almost all of the details. Yeah. Yeah, it is difficult. And it's something that the MOD don't do particularly well. Uh, you'd think they would have mastered it by now, but they haven't. Uh, and I don't imagine they ever will because people just rotate through these tasks and move on to other jobs. So they never learn by their mistakes or learn how they could have done it better. But you know, that's just the way it is. It's not a job I'd ever want to have to do is deliver that sort of news to people uh, unexpectedly. I mean, when you have someone in Afghanistan, you know there's an element of risk, obviously, but you'd never think for one second it will necessarily come home to roost. But it did, and that's where we are with it. So for the next few months, it was just trying to work out what the hell we do, you know, practical issues in terms of work, eating, sleeping, telling people repatriations, funerals, wills, probates, cancelling phone contracts, all of the practical elements that you don't really ever think about. How much of that self-care, because you spoke there around food, meals, blah, 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 like when you're, when you're working with people in bereavement, the one thing I've personally realized is that how their own personal care tends to go completely out the window. They can miss meals and sleep and they can become quite ill themselves it, it, have you found that at all and when you when you're supporting people through bereavement what are some of those um common trends that's exactly as you were saying you do you don't eat particularly well it's convenience food if you eat you know chuck it in the oven or take away or crisps mm. or whatever it happens just eat when you're hungry i guess i mean there's an there's a it's common practice to drink a little bit too much obviously is that misconception that it helps you sleep helps you relax obviously it doesn't do that but perhaps it feels like it does that i'd stopped doing a lot of training obviously because they just didn't seem the right thing to do i didn't have any um wish to do it so you know you probably lose a little bit of weight in in a lot of different ways and you sleep less so you are really a bag of bag of bones walking around and it's awful you do feel awful because you've got the added stress of everything that's going on uh with the bereavement side of things as well and do notice that a lot with what happens to some of the guys from supporting them through strongmen. It's, it's not uncommon. And even when difficult anniversaries and dates come, that does have an impact on sleep, diet, 
all the other things, hydration and all those simple things that can make a huge difference, but it's really difficult. And Maintaining people, a general connection with other members of the family of one of my old colleagues, um, I was, we were on shift together when his son didn't necessarily pass, but his, uh, his son threw himself off something as, as an act of uh, self-harm, unfortunately didn't survive from it. And I remember speaking about how difficult it was and even just maintaining conversation with the partner as in like husband and wife, because sometimes people just sit in different rooms, stay silent. And eventually the, the relation, the relationship kind of people feel like it loses its purpose or one of the big strong ties between them is their children. And when, if they lose them, it's almost like the partner reminds them of it too much. How did you two manage to navigate your way through that successfully? Do you know, it's a, it's a great point. It's a huge challenge. And I've spoken to a lot of, men in particular and about the relationships with their partners or with their wives and how things are because obviously it's a different experience for mum and dad um mum and dad grieve differently they feel differently about it and often they can be playing different parts you know one may be quite stoic in the way they do it and one might be quite visual and out there and neither of these paths are wrong um but you have to respect the other person as well and try and come to some common ground on it. And, and with Sharon, we've always spoken about everything as much as we can do. So when we're having difficult times, we really try and um, speak to each other about that because, you know, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a constant work in progress, but to be respectful for the other person as well. So if, if she feels this is something she wants to do and I don't necessarily think that's what I would rather do, doesn't mean I'm right and she's wrong. So we'll have to, you know, think about it and tend to, I'd rather, I'd rather discuss it rather than do it and then build that animosity between you. So as you say, you drive each other apart. But it's also good to have time apart and, mm -hmm. and be able to sit in silence without that building up. It's a, it's a natural process. Thought is a natural part of that. So, you know, I think you can generally tell when you've been with someone for some length of time if it's just they're just sat there reflecting or if it's a period where they're genuinely upset or they need some help or some support and try and do the best that you can do. I think that's all you can be is there for each other. Um, but there, I think that I did, someone did tell me the percentage of the relationships that fail when a child dies. And it's a huge number. And I mm. spoke to a guy not long ago um, who'd lost his daughter to suicide and he was, would readily accept that he was on a, co a completely different page to his wife. Mm. I just accepted that's it. That's what I found with my friend. Yeah. Because like, uh, one of them, it doesn't matter who, but one of them wanted to do a lot of memorial style events. They wanted to do some, some, some charity work, but not too dissimilar from yourself, but it was very built around the child. It was named after the child. And, um, they, you know, they had friends around and they wanted to do plaques and stuff like that. Whereas the other partner was, I don't, I don't, I don't want this. It's not about anybody else. And that, you know, the, I suppose the why behind it, they had a different perception of why the other person wanted to do that. And that was a big challenge for them. And actually, you know, that they have so many similar correlations to yourself as well. For because for the for the individual that didn't want to do the charity work, they were very conscious that their daughter, similar to yourself perhaps, is still needs to go on and live a life. They still need to live a full life and flourish. And they deserve parents. And it, there's almost like was there ever that? And maybe Yasmin never shared it and it's feel free not not to answer it, but there can almost come a point perhaps where the child doesn't want to continuously remember their sibling because they want you as parents as well. And life does go on for, for them. And certainly it does for you as well. Did, how did you navigate that with, with the Asmin? And was that ever, how, how early into the grieving process were you like thinking about her? I'm sure you were thinking about her all the time, but did you know the question I'm trying to ask really? Yeah. I mean, straight away, I think all, I think we're all trying to think a little bit about the other person. Siblings do get left behind in this process. I think more than the other way, and their their wishes do get do get um, forgotten about. And I think it's really important to to be aware of that. Um, if you asked her, she, I mean, you can tell from what's happened to her since it had a huge impact on her mm. um, career wise. Uh, also, her changing career has enabled her to meet her husband as she now has, and she's now pregnant as well. Wow. Um, so losing James has had a spectacular impact on her, obviously for some terrible reasons, but some positives have come out of it too. And she would, she would acknowledge that. And that's very much in the spirit of James because he was a very positive person. He was a very 
uh, driven person and as is Yasmin, uh, as am I, as is Sharon. So I think I can completely appreciate what you're saying about your friend and how they feel so very differently about it. And I guess it often also depends on how long time has passed because in those early stages, mm -hmm. It helps to fill the space that's left behind. People put a lot of their work into charity or doing good things, as I think most people do, just to yeah. fill that space and feel like you're remembering them with a purpose. But as time drifts on and it becomes longer and people forget a little bit about it and it's not so current, then it can build that sort of animosity because, you know, why do these people are not interested anymore? So I think yeah. you've got to be aware of that at all stages. But I think it really is crucial to say what you both want because – you know, you bring your children up in a certain way. Again, you can disagree with things like discipline and structure mm. and all these things. And you come to a, an agreement usually. So the same thing I think needs to happen. You need to have that conversation. And if we were to ask Yasmin, which we did do, and we've always been a solid three and there's no hierarchy, just because we're mum and dad doesn't mean we outvote her. If one mm. of us said no to anything, then it didn't happen. Uh, it was as simple as that. We were had to be completely unified and that's how we would always do it. So if one of us said, I'm really uncomfortable doing that, I don't think that's the right thing to do. And I don't think it's what James would have wanted. Then we would say, okay, let's maybe park it for six months and come back to it again. We won't do it now. And then what you find is six months later, you don't want to do it anyway. So it obviously was the right thing to do. And I think purely, I don't know if feel, I have the discipline to do that. Yeah, and I, maybe, I'm sure but... I never would know unless unless I'm unfortunately ever in that situation, which of course I hope I'm not. But there's an irony of discipline. Like I would always say, oh, I'm a really disciplined person, but actually I'm less disciplined when it comes to not doing things, if that makes sense. Like I'm disciplined in terms of, oh, I can do this and I can exercise and I can work really hard. But when it comes to not doing something, uh, there's almost the like, I don't know if I would have that in the way that you guys have met I, don't, I think i might end up breaking my family because i'm several spectrums probably and i don't think i would deal with it as well see but you know that which means that you probably wouldn't and i think <laughs> that's a big part of it and when you do cock it up and you get it wrong and you do something you wish you had you learn from it really quickly and it's a case of do you know what i won't make that mistake again because these are important decisions uh, and once you put stuff out there it's always out there and if it doesn't feel right or if it didn't have the right effect then I think you feel, even, you know, these are bigger decisions than they are in normal life. These are big, big decisions. All these decisions you make around loss and death and bereavement and what you do about it are major, potentially life-changing decisions. So you do reflect about it. You learn very, very quickly. And because you're aware of your own shortcomings, you factor that into how you do it as well. So, you know, you may say, yeah, you two disagree with me, but I know I'm right. But then That's you also say, the problem. <laughs> yeah, but you also say, but I know I'm a stubborn git and what yeah. I've got to do is take a step backwards and you will do this um, because you're wrong. Even if you're right, you're wrong because you've been outvoted. And if even one person says no, then you don't do it. You have to be unified if you want to survive. If you're not going to survive or if that isn't your main concern or you're just you know, taking it on the basis of what will be will be, then you probably will go down that route, but you will – probably reap the consequences so you've got to be really mature about it really deep about it and think about all those peripheral things and what impact it may have and obviously what you don't want or what we didn't want is any of the three of us to feel resentment to the other ones because that yeah. something had happened that they didn't want to do so you just park it you just say okay no and i'd have to say 99.9 percent .9 of the time it's proven to be the right thing to do if in doubt don't do it do you think there's an aspect there around, you know, when people feel certain emotions and specifically around bereavement, there's a, I've, I've seen at times the bad behavior where I always describe it, where people say you shouldn't feel that way. Like if you, if you're still upset after two years, or if you feel something is wrong and you don't want to be part of it, like some of the examples of if a family member wants to do one thing, when people say we well, shouldn't feel guilty or it's, it's wrong to feel this, you can't, emotions aren't really a, yes, no, right, wrong, and I'll let you Because if you are feeling genuinely upset, I can't stand here and say you shouldn't feel upset. Because in your mind, rationally, you've, or in whatever manner, you've taken yourself to a point where you genuinely feel um, hopeless or upset or angry or whatever it might be that you're experiencing. So I suppose the worst thing to do in those moments is to try and deny that person's emotion and blindly carry on yourself. Hmm. Be patient with people. I mean, this... 
we've just put the Christmas tree up. Um, it's taken us nine years to put that Christmas tree up since wow. James died. His birthday is on the 22nd of December. So Christmas is always a big thing for us. So we haven't put a Christmas tree up for nine years. My wife put it up this weekend. So a massive, massive day for her. Was and that a, a huge conscious challenge. thing then, sorry? Or was it just you res- re- you like weren't looking forward to this time of year or you resented it? Or was that a conscious thing that you didn't, you felt bad to celebrate in a period of time where so much emotion came came back maybe? I don't know. Just a very difficult time of year. Uh, really, yeah. really difficult time of year for us because Christmas was, a, we were, particularly my wife, a very Christmassy person. Christmas was a massive thing and it just didn't feel the right thing to do. I would never have said to her, let's put the Christmas tree up, shut up, get on with it. We've got to do it. Or it, consequently, after nine years, I couldn't. It, it wasn't right for me to say, I don't want the tree up now. We've not had it for nine years. It was like, whatever works for you, I'm happy with. Because for me, it wasn't, um, it wasn't as big a thing as it is for her. But yeah. I can see what a massive thing it is for her. So, but what happened was last year, our daughter got married on James's birthday. So on the 22nd of December, oh we have a positive side of it. Yeah, it was challenging. But what we thought... Was that a conscious has, decision, sorry? Yeah, 100%. So mm. it's put a positive thing on a difficult day. So... Now it's not just James's birthday, it's Yasmin and Luke's wedding anniversary. And it feels right. And that's what I say to you. It just feels, when they were looking at the date, there were certain dates that came up, not just his birthday, but about other things that had happened. And this just felt like the right thing to do. So in discussion with all of us, it was like, do you mind if? It's like, now let's have a think about it. And 100% no, it feels like the right thing to do. But we could easily have said no, but... It was just between all of us, we came up with that decision. So now I think has unlocked other things. So now we not celebrate Christmas, but it's more normal for us to celebrate Christmas in a traditional way. Unfortunately, it means this year on her first anniversary, she'll be away for James's birthday <laughs> and her anniversary. But again, we we also know we appreciated that when we made that decision. So that's what I'm on about when you're thinking about all the periphery. It's like, yeah. okay, so that'll be Yasmin's wedding anniversary. So whereas we've always spent the dates together, we might not do in the future. And it's like, do you know what? That's absolutely fine because we're still very close. If she's not physically here, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. It's the best for all of us. Uh, and so it's a real gently, slowly approach to things. But there is nothing worse when people say, oh, you should be doing this now or it's not what the, the classics, not what they would have wanted. Yeah, well, they wouldn't want to be dead. And yeah, if they saw the impact of their death, yeah. yeah, and if they saw the impact of their deaths on you, that would make them feel even worse. So let's not even go down that route. So it's always the case, you know. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's just like just it's got nothing to do with you. You can't solve the world. There's no such thing as an Instagram quote to mend this. Just <laughs> let me be. Just let me be. So how did things change for you after James's death? Because that really brings on, you know. I mean, obviously there was there was the charity. There's some of the the efforts, and there's some of the other adventures that you've been on since that. How did it reframe life for you, you know, losing your son as he flourishes into his into his adult life, really? Everything's changed. I'm a different person. Uh, we, we do look at it like an AD, B, a BCAD sort of thing. We, everything is before James died and afterwards, which sounds bizarre. You know, even kinds of, what year did we go to Mallorca? Oh, James was with us, with us, so it's before two. It's bizarre. So we're different people. Yeah. Um, we have different experiences. I wouldn't be talking to you now. I wouldn't have been on SAS Who Dares Wins, et cetera. So every part of my life is different. I probably wouldn't live in this house because we wouldn't have moved when we moved. I wouldn't be doing the job I did. I never would have met Dan. There would be no strong men. Every part of my life has been impacted. And but I, why did I you want that. to change that? Why didn't you just grieve and then carry on as, as usual? Why? There is no usual. I mean, it's everything is, I accept that everything's changed and I wouldn't necessarily want or be able to go back to the old thing because Mm. those superfluous things like careers and holidays and cars, they really don't matter as much as they did before. Now I'm not saying we don't like to enjoy holidays, Mm -hmm. traveling, nice things. Of course we do, but the emphasis has totally changed. So it's now a case of we've got so many extra plates to spin. So we're constantly thinking what's best for us, me personally, my wife, my daughter, my son-in-law, all these different aspects come into it. So they all have to be brought into that equation of why we do things. And we come to a stage in our life, we often talk about it. I'd say I'm 50, Sharon's 49, uh, our daughter is 30. She's just about to have her first child. What do we do next? So we're in a house that's a reasonable size. 
yeah, what do we, where do we go next? What do we do next? What what happens next? So we're in we're in that limbo stage at the moment where I think in the next three or four or five years we'll know where we've got to go, but we also just let the current take us there a little bit. And... Hey folks, just wanted to jump in with a quick piece around firefighter health and well-being. Whether you are trying to join the fire service and pass them tricky fitness tests, if you are currently serving or if you are coming up to that next chapter of your life retiring from the emergency services, we get so many different questions around it. So in partnership with Fitness for the Frontline, we have come up with a series of guidance and programs specifically designed to reflect the physical elements of the role of a firefighter. So whether it's carrying an LPP across an overgrown field, lifting a ladder above your head, underrunning it, or wrestling with cutting gear for 30 plus minutes at some kind of complicated RTC, our bodies are required to lift, push, and carry objects in very specific circumstances. That is effectively what Fitness on the Frontline focuses on, as well as the longer term aspects of overall health and wellness for our firefighters. Now, we are definitely not about to be smashing out world records or getting that beach body ready in six weeks rubbish. The systems and programs that we put in place are adjusted for people's current fitness levels and they're not a prescriptive weight or a one size fits all BS. It is very likely for myself personally that I'm still going to be a firefighter when I'm 60 plus. So longevity in the role is really important to me and I know it is for so many people out there. It all starts with no obligation, seven days worth of the programming, absolutely free. So whether you're joining, serving, or looking at the next chapter in your life, Fitness for the Frontline is designed by firefighters for firefighters. Now back to the show. I find that so exciting. So exciting. But I also think like, is there an aspect of me that therefore also maybe struggles to do something continuously? Like I've, I've owned a number of companies in the past and I've done... I've been in the fire service for 17 years, but I've always been done different things, different stations, different departments, different things. And I wonder if maybe, I don't know, am I running away from something sometimes or am I just impatient because, or is it that, you know, this, this generation in this age now, we are much more open to the fact of chapters of life where just because you did something for 10 years doesn't mean you have to do it forever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And it doesn't. I mean, I firmly believe that I've made most of the major decisions in my life I've got right because I don't rush them. I've seen stuff, and if it's too good to be true, generally speaking, it is too good to be true. And if there's career opportunities, there's investment opportunities, and there's all these different ones, I've probably missed the odd one, but I've made most of the right decisions in my life because I try and look at it on the basis of not being selfish and how that impacts me, my family, my income, people around me, and all these things, not just it feels right. Let's do it. It's I, I try and think about things as much as I possibly, I'm a, I'm a thinky person. That's not, I would like to plan everything out because I don't, there's an element of planning things out and an element of reflecting on stuff. But I kind of, with all the experience I have in so many aspects of, of my life, I kind of think that I, I get things right. It might not be right for everybody because it might means I've missed out on a six figure salary, but in the long term. Mm. it's enhanced my quality of life so i had lots of job opportunities when i was uh before james died where i could have earned double my salary and i was on a six-figure salary i was doing very well so it's massive salaries mm. but it would have would have had a huge impact on my family i wouldn't have seen them obviously what happened after that with losing james i would have never got over that and i would hate to be one of those persons that said i wish i had had more time with my children. I wish I'd done the simple things in life that I can't do anymore. It's like what people do on their deathbeds when they're ill is like, I wish I'd been a better dad. I wish I'd been a better blah, 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 blah. So it's like, don't wish for it. Just fucking do it. It's yeah. really simple. Yeah. Don't worry about the money. It'll sort itself out. Don't God, worry it's about fucking the house hard to rip yourself away from that stereotype though, isn't there? For so many it's, people, so many people. It's only when bad shit happens that you can do it really or that you Isn't get that the, sad though that we have to go into the valley to find those moments of realization like you've never you've, been you've been into a deep it? valley to have those yeah. moments but is there any do you believe there's any way for people to have those moments without having to experience the things that you and your family and so many others have probably not uh people reflect on it. it's like the old thing when you go to india you see how happy they are with nothing you go, fuck you go, all, God, yeah. I, I wish i could do that it's like of course you can do it you just don't have the courage to do it or you don't have the need to do it and because you know we all want netflix we all want blah 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 it's what's important for you at that time and I don't only think when we do you, want that to. changes i think we think we should because other people associate joy to it so we're yeah, like maybe. that must equal joy and then we're, we're all blindly marching down a path and then there's the other people like from india or like yourself 
wandering off through the high grass going, why the fuck are you lot going that way? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and they're all well, just I, going, we're heading and towards I guess that's happiness. Why. And, and even the people all the way at the front are going, oh shit, we took a wrong turn a long time ago. But no one in the rest of the queue has realized it yet. No, and I guess that's why you need those life-changing things to happen to yeah. realize it. So talk to me about going on the show. That was a pretty strange, weird, big decision to make perhaps you know you were 44 when you went on it yeah. why good question uh it's a weird one because like if i roll back a little bit so we always had a huge interest in the military stuff so my granddad had, had, had beaten into me a couple of things it was the gurkha regiment and the, and the, and the sas were the two he had because he worked with both parties when he was in uh, in the army huge amount of respect so he always used to speak to it to, to, to me about it when i was a kid so in the same way, I sort of brought a little bit of that to, to the family, to James. So when James died, the first series was on shortly afterwards, which was filmed in South Wales, very close to where James was based. And some of the places that featured on it uh, were places that we had recently visited when we went down to James's um, base in Broadie in southwest Wales. So there was that sort of connection there. I liked it because it had that sort of dark element to it, that psychological side of it. It wasn't the usual purely physical uh, and it said at the end of it if you want to apply email here or whatever it was or register yeah. your interest here so i thought oh why not not the usual sort of thing i would do so I registered my interest months passed nothing and then i had a, a an email or a, whatever it was i think it was an email yeah um do this fill in this come to this test which i did which i passed as you know there's a number of physical tests there's medical stuff really there's some process, psychological yeah. stuff it is long. I mean, this was series two, so it probably wasn't as many applications. It was men only. So oh, wow. again, so I remember turning up to this little um, TA center in somewhere around Clapham, full of like ninjas doing stuff. <laughs> you know, stood against the wall on one finger doing a hand. So I remember sitting there going, what are you doing what here, Brian? <laughs> yeah, you're 43, I was at the time. You're an old man creaking and aching. It's like, oh, I'll just do it and see how you get on. So went through that. And it was great to see how many of these ninjas failed. And yeah. I just sort of balls through it. And before I knew it, I was at Heathrow Airport with a pair of boots on, heading out to Ecuador via Madrid, thinking, well, that escalated quickly. Um, <laughs> and there you are, aren't you? It's just weird. It's like I never thought that this would actually lead to this. And mm. here I was in a bizarre part of the world like yourself. And that's part of it. You know, people don't appreciate the environment and the travel and all the new, you know, when you – when you go from Heathrow to Madrid, Madrid to Quito, Quito internally to Ecuador, you're jet lagged, you're mm. feeling like shit because you've not really eaten, you've not drunk anything. There's nothing, none of the kit or supplies that turned up. There'd just been an earthquake in Ecuador. There was a Zika virus. It was always this, also the second series. So those lovely waterproof mic things that you were wearing, yeah. we didn't have that. Those developed because we just got massive scabs across us and sores <laughs> and stuff. So we were very much the, the, trailblazers for the overseas yeah. stuff i like to call yeah. it the originals so yeah. i don't know how I, I remember standing there going you idiot you yeah. absolute idiot plum stood here with these 24 other blokes bizarre what did but you i loved it get from the experience what did you think you were was it that connection to james you wanted to feel or was it uh, just outside the comfort zone what what were you hoping to get from it because that's one of the things they always asked us is what, what do you want yeah to why are you here i mean i think there definitely was an element of connection i wanted to just get an understanding of what it might be like to go into these environments but i didn't really think about it if i'm honest hmm. i did it's not something i thought what do i want out of this process i thought you know it'd be good it'd be fun uh, it'd be a great experience to do these things and see these things and obviously i thought i was going to smash it and it's going to be great but I, I just i don't know if there's any one reason there was a lots of different reasons why i did it the first series that I enjoyed and where it was kind of felt like I was a little bit drawn towards it. Mm. Uh, one of the main things that I got out of it was I had some medical issues while I was in the jungle. Mm. The doctor we had at the time, Sundeep, which I don't think he's done the last few series. Uh, he sent me back to get some tests when I was back in the UK, which eventually led to my diagnosis with prostate cancer. So I had prostate cancer while I was doing all of this uh, and experiencing all of this so and if i hadn't have done it it would never ever have got found because even the symptoms i had weren't really symptoms of the cancer they were just general sort of symptoms so it would never have been found and i would probably be either dead now or on the way to being dead so that's whatever happens and i look at it in a fairly spiritual way and i honestly think that 
something drew me towards that. Uh, and whether it was James or not, or whether it was just me knowing I wasn't well, I don't know. But I genuinely feel that that was the main reason why I did it. So when you got, you weren't feeling well over there. When would this discovery of cancer come through? So I had different tests when I got back to the UK. Um, everything ranging from a bladder scan, which is deeply unpleasant, to a prostate examination, which is deeply unpleasant, to a mm. CT scan, MRI scan, and eventually a biopsy, which is where they picked it up. Um, and I had to have my prostate removed, which is a fairly extreme operation, uh, mainly because I'm a, a youngish person. So they felt like I should live at least another, let's say, 30 years, 40 years. So it was worth taking it out rather than going through radiation mm. Um or some of the other treatments are How available. How did you feel because getting told that you had cancer? Didn't bother me at all, to be honest. But destroyed my wife. She was in bits. Had to ring my daughter and tell her, and she was obviously deeply concerned. But having been through what we had been through, it was if I had a, a heart rate monitor on, I don't think it would have changed at all. It was like, yeah. oh, well, next next thing, <laughs> <laughs> off we go with that. So, That's yeah, strange, bizarre. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, that what, worried what me a little your, bit. Your relationship with mortality had it changed through time or had you always kind of been that way around it or do you think you were numb in some way or because that i i think that sounds strange it is strange uh, and i'd say my my opinion of mortality had changed and definitely has changed it may have gone back slightly to, more towards what it was but, but i didn't care if i died at that particular obviously i did care if i died but if it was to be that i was going to die it, it wasn't what it would have been um, how I would have felt before mm. I'd been through uh, losing James. So it was, it, I was okay with it, if that's the right word. Obviously, I didn't want to die and I was conscious of the impact that it would have had instantly. I was conscious of the impact it would have had with Sharon and Yasmin. Uh, and I was determined to do everything I could to treat it and to fight it and all of those sort of things, which I did. But if it was one of those things where there's nothing I can do about it, there's nothing I could do about it. So I have always been a little bit like that. If there's nothing I could do about it, then there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to worry about it. I I worry a little bit sometimes about that mindset. So some of the work that I do with mental health and, and, and trauma and supporting people through trauma management, one of the things that always rings true to me when people say, oh, how do I know if someone's that old quote of, uh, you know, it's having a normal reaction to an abnormal series of events. So if you have, and a reaction that's outside the normal well that's okay because you've just experienced something traumatic and you should feel differently about it but it's when you have almost no reaction to it and there's a big thing in, in frontline services and certainly emergency services with our constant exposure to trauma around and i speak about it ad nauseum the the empathy exhaustion where you've been through a number of events of different irregularities and you almost become a bit numb to it and you can appear cold to other people and it can have a very destructive effect on your relationships friends colleagues things around you um but you just kind of dealt with it yeah i'm like that though so if i try i've always been lucky but i'm relatively calm when bad things happen because i do take a bit of time to think about it properly and the impact it would have and then get some of the medical advice and see what they say they're the experts in this case what impact will it have what are my options then i'll talk to again talk to the family about what's the best yeah you know, it's my body but what's our best decision here and i mean they're just like whatever they say get it done uh, and it's like okay i get that but let's <laughs> okay. also put some of the other you know what impact will the surgery have on me in all sorts of different ways so i like to be fully compliant with all the facts before you know i do make a decision like that and, and try and make the right one but I, I tend not to flap too much in most situations flaps the wrong word i couldn't think of a more articulate word but i, I tend mm -hmm. to sort of take my time with it um now that's not to say when i was sat there on the trolley waiting to go in which was bizarre on a saturday morning in guildford i was fortunate to have private health cover literally no one in the bowels of this hospital just two doctors yeah. one was doing like rocky stuff walking up and down psyching himself up i remember thinking at that time oh shit this is more serious than <laughs> i thought it was <laughs> and then i woke up like seven or eight hours later uh, and it had been quite a difficult operation it had been more widespread than they thought um which would have been hell on earth to sharon because she's being a nurse she understands it and she was in conversation with them so 
Fortunately, I just a burden of knowledge there, isn't there? It's almost like you yeah. know a bit too much about stuff and you're like, yeah. oh, God, I've seen that. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. And I just literally woke up feeling like, that's the weirdest thing is I went in as a fit guy and I came out feeling like an old man who'd just been <laughs> smashed around, which I had been for six hours or whatever it was. So I, I went in feeling all right and I came out feeling dreadful, which was, and then you think, that was Surgery is traumatic, decision. very traumatic oh, on the body. You know, again, yeah. I've been going through recently myself. They always say, with any injury and stuff like that, if you can treat it without surgery, it's good because it's very traumatic on the body. And you do lots of stuff like we were just saying before I came on that things you just don't expect the, the the body to react to or take so long to recover from. You did obviously through the show meet Dan Cross, Ollie Ollerton, some of the people you've so taught. How did that? How did the arc of that relationship coincide with the show and also your, your your cancer treatment and recovery? So I met Dan through the show. He did the series after me, did the third series in Morocco. Dan had lost his wife in 2015. Uh, and Ollie put us together. He'd obviously uh, met Dan through the show and thought we had some sort of shared experiences, which clearly we do. Uh, and that we used, I mean, we'd both used well-being and exercise as part of our recovery. So we felt, you know, Dan had had an idea that he wanted to put something together where to help other people like ourselves using exercise and getting into that sort of groups of similar experience. Uh, and we started the conversation. So Ollie wasn't what, really part of that. What do you think that. drove Ollie to do that? Because that doesn't seem, Ollie's a busy guy, as they all yep. are, as we all are. Why did he do that? That, it seems, and I don't know him at all, but that seems quite a strange, not saying he's not a nice guy, but a strange charitable good deed to do yeah. to put together two people with strong purposes to ultimately create something that, that's helped a hell of a lot of people that's a strange thing for someone to do why why do you think ollie reached out and made that connection uh you'd have to ask him i don't really know um i guess because if you I, hadn't have I, done you wouldn't have been able to help so many people and we wouldn't have created something that, 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 that's, that's been so impactful again chapters of life forks in the road weird yeah yeah i mean i don't know i honestly don't sometimes it, it's just a destiny it's a fake thing put us together and then we started that conversation and it ebbed and flowed for a while and eventually we came up with strong men and we're now a, a registered charity we've been going for three years as a charity in a year earlier than that as a uh, cic uh, and it's it is a, a fantastic uh, opportunity for both dan and i to to give a little bit back it helps with ourselves with our own healing gives you great experience in dealing with people and dealing with different aspects of life and no matter how bad you think your life is there's always someone worse off than you and keeps you humble keeps you driven keeps you determined keeps you all these different things uh, unfortunately ollie didn't stay involved for very long he just helped us initially set up uh, and then soon dan and i sort of took that forward and we got to meet people like jeff brazier we met jeff through the show again he was one of the um one of the psychologists in the show, Victoria, I'm not sure she was part of yours Victoria as well. Victoria is still part of it, yeah. Yeah, she's great. So she put us together with Jeff. Jeff obviously has a, an experience with bereavement. He lost his uh, his biological father, was the captain of the Marchioness and died. Uh, obviously, Jay Goody, so the experience of bringing his two kids up. So all of these things, we've met these great people through the show. Mm. Um, and again, it just kind of, I don't know why it happened. It feels like it kind of was, we were just sort of, magnetically drawn in that general direction i think it's it's one of the great successes of the show to, the, that charity is 100 oh, yeah. percent formed in the ashes of sas who dares wins because without that definitely dan and i wouldn't have met um and then we don't have a no daunting or nervous about the prospect of starting a charity because i'm involved in no. charities i support charities but very massive colossal jump between supporting something and being responsible for it and you know, being being so closely associated with it and almost being an ambassador for it, that that's quite daunting. I don't want to say well, yeah. but it is it's a charity at the end of the it day. Is so it, yeah. It is dangerous. Yeah. Well, this is another alive. one of those ignorance is bliss type moments. Yeah, it's like, that's what I'm how saying. hard could it be? It's like really hard. Yeah. And it is. You have to keep so many plates spinning, and the fun part is the fundraising and doing stuff. You know, skydiving, runs, whatever it is. The more difficult part is using that funding in the right way to support people in their various challenges uh, and developing it and involving the, the charities. And say last week, me and my colleague, Mark, we were doing a two-day first aid, outdoor first aid that we have to do 
uh, update for our, all of these things have to happen going on in the background mm. the safeguarding and the well-being of everybody we look after is is key really but it's often an area it's not particularly glamorous and it's not particularly easy or nice but we all of these different aspects fortunately my background in business previously has enabled me to wear lots of different hats and mm. i've got i'm quite good at doing stuff dividing it up and putting it into a little bit of a structure and and it's I'm a and i love it at that <laughs> yeah it's difficult but you get better you like, do get yeah, better at these things but it goes um, wrong exercises in business like belbin or they also do uh skills finders or like myers briggs was the old-fashioned ones and like you have yeah. the the doers and the speakers and the innovators and the completer finishers i'm crap at that back end of stuff i'm very much like let's go forward and I'll keep churning up the grass and throwing it over my shoulder. But if you haven't got wonderful people like yourself with those different skill sets, who are often sometimes the unsung heroes, and I'm sure Dan also has, and the other members of the team, your partner included, have a myriad of skill sets that they all bring to the table. But without those boring bits, the vehicle doesn't go anywhere. It's almost like they're the wheels. You're the engine, but without anything else, it's not going to get driven forward. Absolutely, but you know that, and that's that in itself is all you need. You just, you need other people around you. I know I need other people around it's me so to hard, make sure, though, especially with a charitable effort, because like people, you you know, you want to hold people accountable, and when the purpose is so like you get the driven by the why. The why is so important to you. You're yeah. like, oh god, it, why is it not this important to everybody? Because some people will be like, yes, well, there's a lot of charities out there, you know, from there's uh, there's this and that, and you're like. Oh, I, I, oh, I struggle with that. I struggle with that. That is hard. I mean, it is hard. And I wish, you know, people think that you, you run a charity, you knock on a door, they open the door, throw loads of money out, you go, have, <laughs> em, empty the shelves, have whatever you want. But it's not the reality of it. All there's lots of charities out there. It's its own competitive industry. You can only plow your own field. And that's what we do. We, mm. We've learned by our, you know, sometimes you put a lot of time into something that doesn't really work out. And if it does, it's not what you wanted. So you'd learn quickly what works. You learn what people waste your time. You learn what is a waste of your time resource. And you just go down that route of working, working as best as you can, like, like anything, but charity is hard, really, mm. really hard. And obviously with COVID and other cost of living crisis, it's even harder than, you know, it's probably as hard as it's ever been, yeah. but no point of looking and moaning at people and going, why can't we have that? Mm. Tough shit, mate. You haven't got it. You've got to just <laughs> deal with what you have. You've got to find that somehow yourselves. And that's what the challenge is. And it's a daily challenge. How do we get that, which will make us get that, which will make us get that, and so on and so on and so forth. Mm. But the more people you talk to about it, things like doing this, makes people aware of it. They talk to people. The, the charity in does pond. well, though, is, um, and it's one of the kind of like, I'll be honest, it's like one of the selfish reasons that really appealed to me is the kind of weekend experiences and stuff because people receive treatment and benefit from treatment and or support in very different ways and i mean in the fire service there's various brigades just do these informal kind of walk and talk and they're just kind of social groups that are set up but i feel like that is a very sm a significantly smaller or simpler version perhaps of, than the complexity of some of the stuff you do where you take these groups what is it about those outdoor experiences that you feel walks so well hand in hand with the process of bereavement or people's inability to kind of open up in environments like that versus meeting in village halls or something like that let me put this back to you um the people you've just done sas with are you mm -hmm. keeping contact with them yeah all the time it's a little whatsapp <laughs> group and i've had them all on the podcast and yeah we've got plans to do stuff together next year like are you i'm in snowden and things like that <laughs> and is it a different friendship to any other friendships you've got Yes, 100%. There's a very strange it's the connection. the same process. Share, isn't it? okay. It's exactly the same. Some of the things that we learned from our experiences on the TV shows, how a big group of complete strangers from completely different backgrounds would never have met each other can bond so quickly and uniquely. So our SAS Who Dares Wins is loss and bereavement. That is, the, that is what binds us together in the same way that that does. Uh -huh. So we have that unique connection. Uh, a lot of it's physical because uh, you've shared that you've been you've lived together outdoors same mm. as what we do so we've just replicated that all we've scaled it down a lot obviously because we don't want to beast people and break them what we're trying to do is build them up and 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 not um we're just trying to build them up and repair them for want of a better word so we provide that environment the backdrop outdoors camping barbecue climbing a mountain looking up you know, trying to achieve that, some of the activities we do. So it's the same process. It's exactly the same. It's just what binds us together is is different. It's not the experience we've had 
uh, around the world in I SAS. Think something it's so very unique fun. about how that helps people process things because it's almost like when I've done similar things with people, it's like we're about to undertake a challenge, big or small. And this one, like, and I looked at some of the experiences that you do, as Snowden being an example mentally and you by yourself or even though a lot of what you do is also peer support so there's obviously a, a coaching slash mentoring slash peer style support as you go through these adventures but it's like it's almost like a physical manifestation of going through a process there's a start there's a middle there's some suffering there's some challenge there's some bonding there's some sharing and there's a sense of achievement and a sense of uh, accomplishment and that you can get through things Lots of things, very varying in difficulty, varying in physical or emotional. And I've found them to be very, very effective, even though sometimes like sometimes you don't even need to share or you don't, you know, it's not like you're going to hold hands around a campfire singing Kumbaya. That's not what it's about. Um, some people can probably go on some of these experiences and perhaps never share some of the things they've gone through and still find tremendous benefit from it. Have you found that? 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we get there and it's, Within minutes, it happens. It's like we're always slightly concerned because we don't know the people, we don't know the dynamic, no one knows each other. And we always think, oh, maybe this group won't bond so well. But every single time, within five minutes, everyone's helping put tents up, everyone's mucking in. And some people, like you say, speak about their experiences. Some people don't say a word about it, but they'll have chats in other departments. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But you all know you're there for that reason. And you're going through that shared experience. And as a group or as a team, you've got much more chance of reaching what you're or achieving what you're trying to achieve than if you sat there on your own because you go oh, it's pissing with rain i'm not going to snowden i'll do it another day whereas you go i know i've got to go it's all laid out this is the job blah 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 and I've done, you just got to turn up on a given day a given place and everything else will be taken care of so that's I think, the big thing as well is the fact that the people worry about the complexity of doing something like this they, they feel strongly they would benefit from something like it but it's actually very difficult to plan this sort of stuff yourself i just had a mountain leader on the podcast from a member of scottish fire and rescue service and he facilitates things like that for his brigade professionally but he says that it's amazing what people get from experiences like this if you can take away some of the scary complexity because it's no more or less challenging just doing it yourself but if people wanted to spontaneously go out there and do it by themselves um we could end up and there are a number of people die you know just walking and mountaineering and fell running every single year absolutely yeah, you've got to be respectful for the elements. The, <laughs> you know, Snowden is still a mountain, and the weather is what it creates the battle. <laughs> yeah. Even in the middle of summer, you're looking at it going, how you get can snow it on be? the top. <laughs> and how, how could it be so cold, misty, you can't see anything? <laughs> it's like August. It's bizarre. But that's also part of the sense of achievement when you do get up there and down again. It's fantastic. I mean, there is literally no better place than the outdoors for this sort of stuff. It's just sat in a classroom, sat in a doctor's surgery, sat in something, it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, straight away, you're like, I don't want to be here. I just yeah. don't want to be here. I don't want to talk to you. You're outside in Snowden. This place has been here for hundreds of thousands of years. We'll be here for hundreds of You look around, you go, just a speck, uh, just a speck on the horizon. Yeah, That's all I am. Like, of a look flash of a blink of an eye in this whole big turning great world. Level yeah great leveler it. and off you go and it's the perfect backdrop and we absolutely love being up there it's stressful there's loads to do dynamics of people it's, it's never an easy process and by the time dan and i get back we are knackered yeah but every single time it's done the job and it's helped people mm. and that's what it's all about it's fantastic so what kind of habits or behaviors because it sounds as though you've gone through a very very we spoke about that chapters of life and your different perspectives on mortality and what's valuable to you have there been any habits i don't want to say tips or tricks or hacks or anything like that but has there been any perspectives or habits that you've developed over the past kind of three to five years doing these sorts of things that you feel have probably perhaps helped you the most or or the ways that you found to help most of people that attend these events 100 percent. so for me i diary in advance of what I'm doing the next day or the next coming day. So I'm organized. <clears throat> I know what I've got to do. I mean, it's, I'll show you, this is, this is today's. It's a lot of stuff. Oh God. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> that's, a, that's a full page of, what is it? A5. There's a lot of stuff on there. Yeah. brother. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff, but without that, I would just, I would fall to pieces. So my days are arranged in advance. And I also do a diary afterwards. I reflect on what I've done, how I felt, what challenges I've had, how I've dealt with them interesting things that have happened 
you know, it's not for anyone to read back. I, I've never read it about, but it's nice to, to download it into a physical thing. It feels mm-hmm. like I've sort of processed it a little bit. So for me, that's a massive, massive tick in the box. Uh, I always live in difficult times like like a dog. We spoke about dogs earlier. Literally, you don't see unhappy dogs unless they've got grim owners. They literally live in the moment. They don't worry about the past. They don't worry about the future. They just deal with it as it is, and they're happy. Mm. So when things get tough, that's what I do. I don't think about, you know, what might happen at Christmas, for example, 10 years. It's, it's something I can't control. So I try and live a little bit like that. And like probably like you, I do a lot of physical stuff. I keep myself active. I try and train, try and train three, four times a week. That's doing perfect. stuff I enjoy. Hasn't got to yeah, be crazy ultra marathon shit, but it's just about no. connect because your body can also produce so many of those natural chemicals. You haven't got to throw in the caffeine and the, the not there's anything wrong with SSRIs or antidepressants or anything, but it's like give your body the opportunity and have the patience to help you. Like it's the same you said about out. diarizing as well. You know, if they I forget what the quote is like, if you stay in your head, you're dead. You know what I mean? Write things down, contextualize them. When you sometimes when you put things on paper, even though it's a big list like you've got today, it can almost be less overwhelming because you're not in that frantic mind of, God, I don't want to forget. What have I got to remember? And, yeah, absolutely. I can't, I can't, and my, nothing. My, your mind will always fail you. It will, just like uh, we're human. Don't yeah. say, I'll remember all this because you won't and you'll only feel terrible uh, when you forget it. <laughs> absolutely. And when you can tick it all off, I mean, 70% of that, 60% of that is already ticked. So, so that's a feeling of achievement. I'm there because I have bizarre days. I'm seeing you at the moment speaking. We've got, to, uh, we've got a meeting in 10 minutes uh, about a, a, something we want to do an event for to like an exhibition this evening it's press day for a, a play in london that they're where they're associated charity it's bizarre i mean i find myself with these really weird and wonderful things that it's like crazy. just go with it and enjoy it you know these yeah. opportunities that have been provided for me i'm going to make the most of them that's mm-hmm. what i've always done in life tried to make the most of all of these opportunities some of them are crap you know some yeah. of them are just average some of them are like well, what opportunity is today? That's eight donuts for the price of five. What a great opportunity. <laughs> Whatever it is, is just make the most of it. It's amazing how celebrate happy you can wind. be. Yeah, celebrate yeah. this. Tick off the things. It's like literally cut the grass. Yeah, yeah. Tick. yeah. Put it on there because you, you, you otherwise you'd yeah. turn down a little dopamine hit. I'm going to get that dopamine. I'm going to write it down. Yeah, it was small and pathetic and I freaking did it and now I feel good. Mm. It's like you've got to do that because you'll, you'll mm. be the first person lining up to whip yourself when you forget the small things. So acknowledge this the is the thing, thing as well. And also, if you don't manage to, it's like, perhaps today I won't manage to do any exercise. I'm not going to let that ruin my day and say, ah, oh, but your rule, Ephraim, always train on a Monday. It's like, yeah, but so what? I'll do it Tuesday instead. It's not a big yeah. deal. Mm-hmm. Don't beat yourself up about it. So, You're giving yourself up, you know, I suppose. Um, life kicks you in the balls otherwise. <laughs> well, absolutely, mate. There's plenty of people out there ready to tell you you did it wrong. Um, how can people learn a little bit more about it? You know, because I know we've, we've only gone through a whistle stop tour of some of the stuff today, and I'd love to be able to people to go and find a little bit more. We're going to put it in the notes anyway, but how can people perhaps access this or go on some of these experiences with you? What's the best way to, to contact? Have a look on the website, which is strongmen.org.uk. All the services we have are on there, and you can sign up for them there and then. They're all free of charge. Uh, follow us on social media, which is at Strongmen Org UK. We're on the usual I think, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. That'll have uh, updates on what we're up to and just reminding people about how they can find us, follow us, and, and support us. And it's, it's all really on those two. Mate, I love it. Thank you so much for your time today. Send my love to, to Dan, to, to Sharon, to Yasmin. Have an amazing time tonight. Um, Thank have, you. you know, send my love. Now to that's Yasmin out of my comfort zone. Celebrations as comfort well. Comfort zone. A play. It's like, oh, oh I love that. I, I need to get back now to London. We used to go once a year, and since COVID, we've not got back into that habit. But I envy you for it, mate. I hope you have an incredible time tonight. Thank you, pal. Hello, brother. Take care of yourself, and I'll speak to you soon. All right. Cheers, mate. Firefighters podcast is put together to develop, inspire, and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter Pete Wakefield. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue, please head over to our Patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast. Please hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to. Please support your emergency services responders, and thank you for listening.